Uh, <laughs> so we might as well get started. So this is a presentation sort of, oh, that says OpenCast workshop. It's not supposed to say that, but this is um, uh, like sort of a general overview of the state of OpenCast. Um, and there's three presenters for this. Um, so uh, I'm Stuart Phillipson from the University of Manchester. And we also uh, have Karen Dolan from Harvard DCE and Sam Lee Pan from the University of uh, Cape Town. Um, uh, so what we thought might be most useful is if we sort of um, uh, gave a very short overview of what OpenCast is and then maybe talked about three different use cases, you know, sort of practical examples of how you can use OpenCast. Um, so first to try and explain what OpenCast is, because that can sometimes be a difficult concept. Um, so uh, OpenCast is really a media management uh, system. Um, Often it's uh, used for lecture capture. I'd say that's one of the most frequent use cases. But you can use OpenCast even if you don't have any lecture theatres uh, at all. So um, one example might be you can use um, an OpenCast capture system. So we have one called Pica, which is an application you could put on some hardware, like a Raspberry Pi or another computer. And then you could use OpenCast to do the, the scheduling, the capture, processing. It can modify recordings. It can add bumpers. It can add metadata. It also archives the video, so it manages your repository of, uh, of collected video. Um, and another way to think of it is kind of like a workflow engine. So you can write workflows for OpenCast that do different things. And that's really where the flexibility and the power of OpenCast comes in, is it can kind of do as many different things to video and audio as you can pretty much imagine. And then OpenCast has a, like a presentation layer that's called Engage, and that's like an internal version of YouTube. So the whole process of uh, producing video to distributing video and managing it in the middle can all be done with OpenCast. But one of the other great things is you don't have to use the whole thing. So you might be like a, a movie studio, for example, and you've got millions of hours of HD footage, and you need that, you know, if you just put it in a folder, that's a very flat way of uh, looking after it and not a very good way of managing it. So you could actually just start with a huge folder of media, and then OpenCast can manage that. It can tag it. It can make it searchable, indexable, and it can even push it out to different distribution channels. Um, you also don't just have to use OpenCast or video files as kind of the origin. So OpenCast has like an ecosystem of recording devices. Actually, there's one at the back of this theater right now that's made by NCAST. But you could use a hardware capture system, or you could build your own capture system using a PC. And um, some cameras, they, they produce RTSP streams, and you can attach that effectively directly to OpenCast. Uh, so there's many origins for the video. And as I say, it's like the workhorse in the middle that decides where everything goes. It manages the integration and it manages the metadata. And then ultimately, it can be distributed to as many channels as you can either think of or integrate. So at Manchester, we have kind of two use cases where we use a custom video portal. And to a certain degree, we also use YouTube. And other users, as you'll hear later, do different types of integrations. And it could just be as simple as putting it into a file store. So that's kind of the whole OpenCast thing. It's, it can produce media, but it doesn't have to. It definitely manages and archives and um, produces the videos. And then it manages the distribution of the video. Um, uh, OpenCast has just hit 10 years, so it's not really a new product. It, it, it's fairly mature. And um, we have this map that we've generated, and it shows uh, OpenCast I hesitate to use the term users, but people that have downloaded it and activated the product. So you can see there's, there's definitely a huge cluster of usage around Europe. Uh, there's a big cluster of usage around America. And then, as you'd expect, because it's around population basis, there's a big cluster around Asia. So if you would want to see this yourselves, you can visit uh, map.opencast.org. And you can click on the buttons to see what the, the user filled out uh, their institution was. And we've seen everything from um, there's a lot of higher education institutions, private companies, and even police forces using open for, uh, OpenCast to, uh, to manage its software. Um, the community itself has uh, two releases a year. So we have a formalized release process uh, where developers and community members get together. Um, we've just sort of finalized OpenCast 7. And you can go to our roadmap to see an, a, a full feature set for uh, uh, every instance that's changing. And uh, we have a time-driven release process. So OpenCast 8, with all these features you'll see here, um, including very advanced features, will be available in December. And uh, after that, we'll immediately move on to OpenCast 9. So it's, it's a very um, uh, schedule-driven process. Uh, so I'll just jump back to PowerPoint and talk about my institution a little bit. So um, 
I work at the University of Manchester and we're a big OpenCast user and that's because we're a big institution. So we have about 27,000 undergraduates, uh, 40,000 students in total, 12,000 staff and about 240 buildings. And this means we generate a lot of recorded video. So we have nearly 370 rooms, all of which have lecture capture hardware in. Um, we produce about 62,000 hours of video a year, and uh, we're heading north of 270,000 archived hours of recorded lectures and, and other media. Uh, and this generates about 6 million views per year. And, and in our use case, this is one example of how you can use OpenCast, it, it really is the central hub for us. So um, upstream from OpenCast, we have a, a timetable, and we suck in the timetable every day. And then this uh, is, the data is kind of massaged by OpenCast into a recording schedule. So we've got rooms, we've got timetable data, events, and the people that teach them. Uh, we allow staff an opportunity to uh, decline to be recorded. Uh, we would normally record staff by default. And uh, we don't use OpenCast's capture agent. We use a or recording device, so that's a capture agent. We use a, a system called Galacaster, which is a software application running on kind of generic PCs. And they make the recordings, and then every day they push them to our video portal via OpenCast. Um, OpenCast is, a, is a, like a heterogeneous application. So in some applications, if you want more of it, you just have more instances. But um, uh, OpenCast is kind of specialized. So I think Karen called it the brain before, but th there's an admin node that manages the entire process. Um, OpenCast has a type of server called an ingest node that just handles file transferring to and from the lecture theaters. Um, worker nodes, which tend to be the most numerous, um, uh, they do the actual processing of the video, so they'll receive a cookbook of instructions about how to make that video from the admin node, and then they'll process it into the final MP4 versions. And there's uh, presentation nodes and file level nodes, and at Manchester we have a bunch of ancillary nodes like database um, uh, uh, operations nodes, um, uh, Jenkins to build the application, that kind of thing. Uh, and they're not all the same size, so our admin tends to be a bit larger because it has to do more work. Workers tend to have more CPU power, that kind of thing. Um, so this is how lecture capture started at Manchester. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, we kind of did it in a big bang way. So we had almost no lecture capture, and we were using like little, little Mac minis, that kind of stuff, to do recordings. And then o o overnight, we almost went to the exact opposite paradigm, where we went to recording everything. And it's, it's no coincidence that in that in-between year here is when we adopted OpenCast. So OpenCast is incredibly scalable. Um, you can record hundreds of thousands of hours of, event, of events with it. We currently have plans to deploy to almost 500 classrooms. And I don't really see any specific bottleneck that's going to prevent us delivering this to every single room in our campus. And OpenCast is also customizable, which is really part of the power of it. So um, in 2016, we started making recordings specifically for disabled students, and we would not be able to do that without the power to modify the workflows. Um, in usage terms, it's quite interesting. Uh, so uh, because OpenCast is very robust, uh, we haven't seen any downtime for two and a half years. And this is really val valuable to students. So um, this is an entire academic year. And you can see these two big blobs are the examination periods. So having a very robust delivery platform is incredibly important to our students because they make use of these recorded lectures so much around examination times. And this is a little bit about our workflow. So um, to explain in brief, we would start off with a lecture like this. Uh, if you at Manchester take no action, uh, much like I did today, you would be recorded by default, and then the recording is delivered to students. Um, you also have the opportunity to decline to be recorded, and this is where the OpenCast workflows come in, and uh, there's importance here. Normally, this would mean no recording would be made, but if we detect a disabled student is in the class, we'll make a, a recording automatically for that group of students. And it's OpenCast that's running that logic. It's figuring out who are the disabled students, what classes are they in, um, how to make the recordings, and then how to manage the ACLs to only make it available to specific users. And then OpenCast even allows you to trim and edit the recordings. So again, one of the neat things about OpenCast is if someone didn't make the recording available immediately, that would be a problem for us. And I know that was a problem at other universities using proprietary products. We were actually able to change um, OpenCast. So um, while a video is waiting to be edited, it's pre-published to disabled students. And then when the video is finally edited, a, a published version is written over the top. 
and then I'll just whisk through some numbers before I hand over, but students really value these recordings. So we asked them, um, how often do you make use of these recordings? And we had 64% uh, um, saying they make use of them extremely often. Um, we had 82% of students saying that they regard having uh, 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 access to lectures as vital. Um, and we had 64% uh, of students saying that they thought that having access to recorded lectures made a significant difference to their assessment marks. We, we also moved on to do some other kinds of capture. So lecture capture is one example of how you can use OpenCast. But, um, and you'll hear more of this from UCT, but we've started to use uh, the same system to do medical assessments. So uh, our student nurses and student doctors, they have to train how to uh, interrogate a, um, a patient to find out what's wrong with them. And we're using OpenCast and Galacaster to record those sessions, give them to students, and allow them to learn from them. Um, uh, so here's an example of what you might see in our video portal. That's, uh, so all this video content would have come from, from OpenCast. And we, we even used uh, OpenCast recently to record at a music festival, so it's robust enough to, uh, to deliver recordings in a, in a professional environment. And the last thing I'll say is uh, if you're interested in learning more about OpenCast, uh, we have a community summit. It's um, in February next year, so 2020, and it's in Belgium, uh, Ghent. Uh, so I'll hand over now. Hi, I'm Karen Dolan. I'm from uh, Harvard University, the Division of Continuing Education. And so we have a student population um, that are accessing material Harvard courses remotely around the world, global in different time zones. And uh, they're often part-time learners, so they have full-time jobs, full-time family obligations. And when they do uh, dedicate their precious moments to learning, we need to optimize um, their time, give them very high quality material, and have it there available when they have time to access it. So for us, the, the media is really um, central to their uh, access of these Harvard courses, so we have to have the material there. It has to be reliable. We need um, dependability. So OpenCast has been very uh, good for us because it's a uh, modular architecture, allows to, us to build in a lot of redundancies and um, error handling and error recovery. Uh, when we have a problem, we can find out very quickly within the modulars what's going on, recover from it. And, uh, and if we can't figure out a problem, we post our questions online. The community is very active, so we get a lot of feedback and a lot of love from the community. So we're very happy to be using the open source for that reason. We're not in it alone. So uh, inputs for our OpenCast. We have these expensive uh, lecture capture devices in some rooms, um, 24 rooms. We have uh, a primary and a secondary. So we actually have two of these capture agents in all these uh, 24 rooms that are specific uh, for lecture capture for our distance courses. Um, and uh, that's our primary source of input. We have about 240 courses um, that go through those 24 rooms. And uh, we have a, about 1.5 million views from last year of students watching uh, lectures uh, captured from those rooms. So another uh, input source is for web conference uh, videos. So in classrooms that need more student interaction, um, they have web conference tools for the live session, and then they record it, and it's up on the web conference tool website. And we know when those things happen from the schedule, if they're sections or if they're courses. So we have a tool that goes up and, and grab, grabs the recording and then feeds them into OpenCast. We also do uploads for um, high quality publications like training videos or introduction videos. And if something happens to our capture agents, we, uh, we can upload a recovery video. In worst case scenario, um, the instructor will come in to re-record you know, the lecture for the distance students. Another common uh, use case is republishing from previous courses or, or taking lectures from other uh, courses and, and using them, sharing them within a, within a new course. So as uh, Stuart mentioned, uh, the workflow engine is very flexible and OpenCast. Um, these are the primary things we do. Uh, for all the media inputs, we transcode them, we normalize them, we have uh, different resolutions so that when the student is using, uh, accessing, accessing these recordings from the player, they don't have any surprises. Uh, we don't have any um, weird uh, types of media at that point. 
We create navigation slides from all the videos so they can click around and find uh, context, um, go to the parts of the videos that they want to go to, and preview images. Um, we don't use all the workflow operation handlers that come with OpenCast. There's a whole bunch. We just pick and choose the ones we want and use those in a configuration workflow. Um, it's very easy, flexible. So the other thing we do is we make transcriptions for all of our uh, lectures automatically. Uh, we use IBM Watson, so we make audio transcriptions, send them out, and then uh, attach those to every workflow. If we need higher quality transcriptions we'll, for uh, disability um, enable people, then we, uh, we use another service and we upload those to our published recordings. So. So as uh, the same use case for Stuart, we can auto-publish uh, videos immediately, trim them later, or some instructors want to make sure their are eyes on the videos first, that they're trimmed and polished before they're published to students. And then the last thing that's commonly done is adding uh, attachments to the, to the media so that students can access course handouts went through the player. So this is the player, student engagement, the main form uh, for student accessing these uh, materials. We use a, a player developed by the University University uh, Polytechnic of Valencia, UPV, uh, made this Paella player. It's got a lot of plugins. It looks like your basic player, you know, with the uh, audio controls, and you can do double speed, different speeds, and you can sc scrub around. There's a lot of plugins. Um, we created this uh, plugin. It's a social tool so the students watching, they can uh, make comments in the context of the lecture and other students can respond to them or they can ask questions and TAs can respond in the context of the lecture so students can see um, a little more richness with the lecture. Some instructors are actually uh, making participation in the social tool uh, attendance requirement and grading on that so students have to uh, add some context or content in the context of the lecture. We also have good usage tracking with the Paella player. It's quite granular, so um, we can tell what parts of the lecture a student watched and how often they watched it, and some instructors are also making that mandatory for attendance. They either have to be in the class or they have to watch the live lecture or they have to have uh, watched a portion of the uh, video that's recorded. So our integration, we have integration with IBM Watson and our LDAP um, for logging into the admin and uh, authorization of the lectures, but um, we have a content management system that uh, is now hosting all of the courses, so we need to integrate with that system to give students a, a similar, the same place to go and uh, same kind of look and feel for all their uh, courses. So on the, your left, we have a LTI tool that is uh, lecture videos, so any course can just uh, put that into their course instance and OpenCast dereferences the course material associated to that course instance, so they just see a filtered list of all the videos relevant for that course. On the right-hand side there, well, so our other use case is embedding videos in a uh, course page, so they might have quizzes or in information around the video within a page, and they might just use a subset of the video within a page, but um, right now we don't have good integration uh, as far as knowing exactly what user is accessing the video at runtime with this LTI content item, this deep linking tool that uh, University of Ghent and Kiel's make, and we're able to uh, know who the user is at runtime and uh, pri provide more context. Uh, about the user when they're when they're running that, and also it it helps with some authentication issues that we have, so users won't get any um, odd additional login weirdness, which uh, makes their experience a lot better. So we are using Amazon Web Services to help us uh, automate our deployment and build, and and also remove uh, system operations involvement from our OpenCast, um, the admin and the workers, that part of it. Uh, system administration is still involved with the capture agent because they're physical devices, so they kind of, they need to handle those to put those into the room. But for all the OpenCast processing, uh, the developers are really in charge of configuring, configuring what's needed and uh, sorting out you know, the sizes that are optimal for the working of the system. So that's 
been very uh, handy using these services. We can just scale up nodes as we need them and scale them down to save money and, uh, and make sure that we have the resources there when we need them. And we have them spread across availability zones. So if the East Coast goes down, network goes down, we still um, can feed videos and, and do processing for people on the other side of the world. We use CloudFront to uh, distribute our media files so that people on the other side of the world can still load their media quickly. They don't have to wait for it to come across from the East Coast. And uh, we developed another tool to help us manage the capture agents in the rooms because we have slightly tweaked configuration for all these devices. It depends on the room's audio and, and visual attributes. So we really needed a central location to help configure these systems so that we could scale them up. Then we can have uh, more of these systems in rooms and not worry about having to manually update them. So our future plans, uh, we want less devices and more capture agent software appliances so we don't have to have these expensive machines. And then a lot of rooms we don't have control over, but we know there's uh, hardware in them that we're allowed to put software on. So uh, we're trying to develop more, more tools for, for software appliance, software capture agents. And I know a lot of other uh, OpenCast adopters are doing the same thing. So we hope that will be a rich environment soon. Of course, we want to automate uh, more and integration tests so that we can deploy faster and upgrade faster with more confidence and then more LTI tools so that we have a more seamless integration with OpenCast and any LMS. So uh, OpenCast, uh, this slide is just to kind of demonstrate the community involvement um, with features and upgrades in the different OpenCast uh, versions. Uh, it's just, it's a really fun community because a lot of universities are working at this. We have weekly um, meetings to talk about features and issues and monthly adopter meetings to talk about how people are using OpenCast. Uh, so that's up to six. And then seven, these are um, seven, OpenCast seven's got a lot of uh, upgrade infrastructure features that we're very excited about, like a lot of underlying library upgrades to help uh, performance across the board with all the services and uh, more granular permission control. Uh, a lot of features to help uh, optimize storage and, and uh, reduce the amount of resources you need. So we're very excited about Seven in particular. I think that is my last slide for that. So, all right, Sam. Um, so I think both uh, Stuart and Karen chatted uh, about OpenCast in terms of workflows and previously we've actually uh, presented something similar to this but I'm actually going to break down each of these um, different use cases and to also talk to them in terms of workflows but um, how we're actually using it within our institution. So the really powerful thing about OpenCast is the ability to customize and um, obviously ease of use is um, paramount for all of the, the cases, but um, also high quality is really important in certain cases, and sometimes you have to balance that with mass production, and um, sometimes there's scheduling functions, sometimes there's editing, and they all, they all land up in some publishing stage. Um, so I'll just step you through. So the first one is lecture recording. So lecture recording is um, one of the most common uh, cases, the original case that OpenCast derived from. But uh, so within our institution, we've been using it for uh, since 2012, I think. Um, and you can, as you can see, we've really managed to scale. And um, I think that we're over, we're probably over 100 venues at this stage. Um, it's really important for the students in terms of um, a backup resource in terms of supplementary resources. Uh, this is a, a summary of one of the ECAR surveys at UCT. It's actually about two years ago, uh, three years ago, and um, lecture recording was mentioned as the third um, most important thing for facilitating like online learning and such. Um, so I think that um, 
Yeah, so essentially we, do, we are producing a lot of recordings, but they also are being used really well. And um, we actually recently did an opt-out model, so this kind of reduces the admin, but also by default the recordings do get published, which is good for the students. Um, your typical lecture will be 45 minutes, but there are some longer ones that will go up to an hour. And in terms of higher quality, we um, have been looking at various different pilots and um, research, and one of the things is lecture tracking. So uh, this is actually the Track 4K project is something that's linked to master students that have used this as the research, and we use it in production in a few venues, um, and we record in 4K, and we crop out. So the blackboards are really important um, as a teaching tool still, and um, getting that uh, focused and that um, clarity in terms of the blackboard actually requires a little bit of um, automated tracking. And um, then the other project is called Lecture Site, so that's also there. And um, the, a, new a new pilot that we've been working on is the captions. So we've been looking at IBM Watson, um, uh, but we've also been looking at um, Way With Words, which is human um, human captions, transcribing, and using an API for that. So that's something that we've been developing, and I'll talk a little bit about the One Button Studio just now, but that, um, that links to how it's been reused in different places. Um, so a while ago, we had a, a protests and such, and our sh campus shut down, and um, I think we usually get this in the LMS, where people just chuck big f video files up into their um, into the LMS and just expect students to use it from resources. But uh, one of the things that our, one of our developers worked on is this LTI upload feature. So if you record something from your phone and it's usually quite, actually it can be quite a big file, um, it uses the existing um, infrastructure and essentially it's just got an extra upload option. So you'll have your multiple downloads but you also go into, uh, in this case, it's a Sakai LTI, and you go under Manage, and you click Upload, and you upload your file there. And then it produces these um, different quality outputs, so the students can download the most appropriate one that they, depending on their data access. So, um, and then also linked to that, there was the screen recorder uh, app, so that's desktop recording, and there's a lot of, um, proprietary solutions there which are have a basically a price tag and a, and a set amount of um, uh, time limits that you can but um, one of my previous colleagues also worked on this and this was a pilot and this is actually there's a link in this presentation or, or uh, tweet out later which essentially um, links to the open car summit where he discussed that um, and there's a yeah so that allowed them to also create videos in different ways and then the One Button Studio, so this is um, a more recent project from last year, and uh, essentially the lecturer would go in to book the studio, they would go into the room, they'd click the one button, start recording, and push the button to stop. And then the presentation and um, recording gets automatically uploaded into the LMS, and they also have this editing option, the editing uh, simplified editor within the um, open course editor within your LMS. Then you can publish to a particular course site, so it uh, updates all the ACLs based on that. Um, and the last case I want to mention is the clinical skills. So. Um, this is for useful like teaching videos. Um, also, where they've done some live streaming, so if the class is too big and they can't all fit within the room and there is a, a patient or such, they could actually monitor through the, through the camera. And uh, student assessment, um, so groups would book this. And oh, I also want to mention that um, Andrew did a very good talk yesterday, so if you're interested in seeing Manchester use case of the clinical skills, um, well, consultation skills um, that really gave a bit of the more teaching background in their case. Um, so for our one, we also run in Gallicaster, and it's, um, yeah, so they, they type in their, their student number, and then they select that, and there's also the PTZ um, controls. So I think the really powerful thing is that we, within the open cast community, it allows for readaption and reuse of um, certain parts and 
uh, catering to different contexts. Um, and that's my last slide from my side, and I just wanted to say thank you to Karen and to Stuart for their work on this. Um, yeah, we weren't the original presenters here, and um, from the University of Cape Town also for my team that works behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, does anyone have any questions? Uh, do we have a microphone? Oh, a microphone. oh okay. Uh, I should say that I might not be able to answer the question. I'm the least technical of the three of us here today. I think some of the last sh slides showed the actual like built-in editor, and I thought that was really interesting. And, and I know you mentioned trimming, and I mean I can barely see it up there. But uh, what other like I assume there's just basic features, or, or like how advanced does the editor go? So I think in the current version, um, uh, uh, it allows you to trim one track. So uh, you have to trim the audio and the video synchronously. So basically, it allows you to cut sections out, cut off the start and end, that kind of thing. In uh, OpenCast 7, I believe the editor is becoming more sophisticated. So it allows you to toggle multiple tracks. So maybe in one instance, you don't want the video of the presenter to be present, or you don't want the PowerPoint to be present. So it's becoming more sophisticated. Is it, has anyone else done, I don't know, something where like it pipes into another type of editing software for advanced stuff? I don't know if anyone has ever done that. So, uh, not that I know of off the top of my head, but I know that Cape Town has stuff, but right? don't you have semi-professional editors or professional editors? And I, okay. And then just one more question. Um, someone mentioned uh, usage tracking. Who was who that? I did. I okay. Everybody does usage tracking. Oh, everyone does use. Is that uh, built in? Or did someone mention like there's a player that does so it? Pi player and player I'm sorry, Paella? Yeah, yes. Pi okay, <laughs> like, like Paella, like <laughs> what I'm thinking of. Okay. Yeah. I got you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, were there any other questions? Oh, sorry. Further back. Oh, oh no, that, yeah, no. the way you are. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, in terms of the roadmap, Stuart, you mentioned that it's time-based, mm -hmm. right, so, so it's pretty, pretty regular, twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, how, how likely are features to, uh, that are on the roadmap, because I see some really, really exciting ones in there, how likely are those to actually get in, and what's what's the visibility within the community? Yeah, so I'd say you know, if the features on there, it's quite likely to get in. We have a formalized uh, process around the release, so people propose features. They have to go for code reviews, and it, depending on the size of the feature, it might be reviewed by one or multiple developers. Depending on the feedback that developer gives on how well or badly the feature is written, um, it might go into that version or the next version. I know, for example, um, uh, Manchester's automatic subtitling didn't make the most recent release, but we fully expect it to go into the next one six months later. So you're never that far away from a specific feature, at least that's, you know, my feeling on it. And it's very public, it's like GitHub, so you can just see all the pull requests and all the comments, you can make your comments. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'd also say that in the past, uh, there's been occasionally features that have been developed elsewhere, and you know you can just uh, fork um, OpenCast, drop it into your local branch, and run it yourself before it's in the official release. And, uh, and the autom automated subtitling was one of the ones that I was interested in. So can you just talk us through what? 
what that will do? Yeah, well, so I think there's a few different versions of it, and this is one of the good things about the OpenCast community is I think automatic subtitling was first written by DCE, and then um, Manchester made another version of it, so it was originally written for Watson, and then we rewrote it for um, uh, Google Speech to Text, and then Cape Town uh, iterated it again for um, uh, actual human manual subtitling. And it's uh, quite variable, the results. So um, with a good quality microphone like this, I've seen results with Google speech to text, you know, in excess of 95% accuracy. I'd say it struggles more when there's multiple speakers. It struggles a lot more if uh, you're using a boundary microphone that's like two meters away from the speaker. Um, but there's options to improve that. So Cape Town actually wrote a workflow which will kick the subtitle out to a human subtitler, and then you'll get vastly increased accuracy, but at a higher cost. Makes sense. And final question just around the caption editor, which is another upcoming feature. So that would be through OpenCast, not through Paya itself? Or? So I, as I understand it, because I've only played with it, um, it's through Paya oh, itself. Okay. It's a, it's a plug-in to Paya. Um, uh, and uh, so the idea is, yeah, you'd say, I want to modify these subtitles, and that you'd do it within the Paya user interface. There would be an extra pop-up that would allow you to, to change those subtitles. Great. Fantastic. Uh, any other questions? Uh, uh, is there like an OpenCast website? Or? Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Final slide or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's uh, opencast.org. Um, so ignore all the mining sites that you'll have to go past. And, uh, and then uh, if you visit that website, it's got some really useful stuff on, particularly around the community. So there's um, multiple uh, email e uh, emailing lists. So there's announcements, um, users, and dev. And I'd say they're very friendly. If you're a completely new user and you're struggling to get OpenCast to run, um, look on those um, discussion forums. You can search uh, the archive of them in Google, but people are quite friendly. There's also an IRC channel, which uh, Ah, there we go, um, which you can join. And there's usually like a good couple of dozen developers just hanging out in there, basically, that you can ask questions to. But obviously, the content from that channel is not archived. Oh, there's also the OpenCast YouTube channel. So if you Google OpenCast YouTube, um, there's almost 10 years' worth of conference presentations in there that cover everything from um, uh, board meetings for OpenCast to uh, cloud deployment and everything in between. So that's a really useful resource. One of the features from the OpenCast presentations, um, some sites have done automated uh, translations of transcriptions and closed captioning, so the Pi player can support you know, multiple different languages. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's from Valencia. They worked on a system where, yeah, it, not, it doesn't just, they've got their own language model uh, that they've built using a supercomputer, and it doesn't just do tr uh, transcription, it does translation as well. So I think it's working in... Uh, Spanish and Gaelic, and I can't remember what other language is, but yeah, the idea is you can get multi, multi tracks. And I think in the Manchester version of the uh, subtitling plugin, you can actually specify the source language in it, and in theory, yeah, it could do translation as well. All right, if there's no other questions, thank you all for coming.